Great. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to today's webinar. My name is Krista Egger, and I lead our green communities work at Enterprise. And today we're gathered here to discuss how to create green, affordable housing. We will discuss how to move through design and construction to operations with the 2020 Enterprise Green Communities Criteria, our newest standard just released in, in January. We'll be talking about what's required, what's recommended, what are the most often overlooked details that you can prepare for now. We'll engage in exercises highlighting critical elements of the criteria and how those relate to your development timelines. And although we won't cover every criterion in the new program this afternoon. By the end of this workshop, we will have examined which components of the criteria differ from your standard procedures, and you'll be able to identify what's required for certification and, and how to find more information. So in normal times, we would have been in person with you all today, but instead we're giving Zoom a try. So thanks for joining us online. And our main ask of you all today is to be present, to engage with us, to resist the temptation to multitask if you can. And we welcome seeing your pets and your children with you on the screen today. So don't, don't feel shy about that. And it's perfectly fine if you eat on camera, if you refill your coffee, if you get snacks, we're, we're fine with that. If you need to get up and stretch whenever you'd like, we'd really ask you to be comfortable and, and be with us for the next few hours. Um, so I know a lot of us have been using Zoom a lot lately, but um, just wanted to give go over a few Zoom reminders. The first one would be, I would like to invite you to keep your cameras on today. I think we'll all get a lot more out of today's workshop if we can see who we're, who we're talking with and understand what kind of community we're in here. So um, I'd invite you to do that. Um, secondly, please keep yourself on mute if you're not planning to speak so we can just cut down on background noise. Um, next, you can flip between gallery view when you see everyone here on your screen equally or speaker view where the person who's speaking is the largest box on your screen. You can do that. You can toggle back and forth with the button on the top right of your screen. So feel free to do that as you'd like. And then if you're experiencing any difficulties with Zoom connectivity, um, try closing other windows and browsers you might have open and that should help with your, with your speed. But if that doesn't solve your issue, please just chat in the box. We've got a stellar team behind the scenes today. Um, today's workshop is going to ensure that you have a good experience. So Gabby Morris Flores is on the line and she'll be helping you out. So don't feel shy about, about chatting us. And then lastly, we'll be sharing a recording of this session with everyone who signed up for this workshop in about a week. So um, we'll also have that available online. So um, if you need to step away for a break, uh, don't worry, you can catch the recording later and you can also share it with your colleagues. So with that, I'd like to turn it over to Elizabeth Richards with our enterprise office in Cleveland to bring you an Ohio welcome. Thanks, Krista. Hello, Ohio partners. And so interesting to see you all this way. Um, and thanks for joining us today. Um, so I'm Elizabeth Richards. I'm in the Enterprise Ohio office. Uh, as you know, we work nationally and then have been a legacy effort in Ohio for many, many years. Um, our team is based in Cleveland, uh, but we work statewide on policy and program. And then we have a number of signature programs operating in the Cleveland and the Cuyahoga County area. Happy to talk to all of you about them anytime. Um, but Enterprise Green Communities is one of the programs that we operate. Um, so I would think of me as the face of the Ohio program. I do have colleagues that also support this work. We are the fourth leg of the stool, if you will. So we've got Krista and the national team operating, uh, you, the developer partners and consultants, and then we've got OFA, Ohio Housing Finance Agency, sort of operating as well throughout the year and the years on this program. So we're facilitating behind the scenes, but always here if you need us. Um, I just want to give an Ohio welcome to those of you who are new to the program. So every year we've got new staff, folks who are new to green communities coming to these trainings. So welcome. And then if you're old hat and you've been at it for a while, welcome to the program update. So it'll be really exciting to see um, some of the updates that are rolling out in 2020. And I think we're all very aware that these updates could couldn't come at a more important time. So um, 
if ever, the need for high quality, climate friendly, um, healthy, affordable housing for our communities and our working and low income families is just greater than it's ever been. So um, thank you to the Green Communities team for leading us through uh, a couple of just really important hours. Um, uh, and thanks to all of you. Uh, final thank you to the Ohio Housing Finance Agency. OFA has been just an incredible partner for almost 15 years at this point. For those of you who don't know, they were an early finance agency to really lean in hard on green building and affordable housing and how to make it work. So we're just always proud and so thankful for that partnership. And, and with that, I'll just hand it, hand it over um, to Diane, who uh, will be welcoming uh, for OFA today. Diane? Thanks, Elizabeth. Welcome, everyone. Um, Actually, Kellen was supposed to talk, but he's having challenges, so I'm filling in last minute. But um, thanks everyone for, for joining us today. Um, my name is Diane Alakusen. I'm the Program and Policy Manager for the Office of Multifamily Housing at OFA. Um, welcome to my kitchen. This is, you know, new, new times. And speaking of pets, my cat is known to make, you know, cro cross in front of the laptop multiple times, so you may see her as well. Um, but we really want to thank everyone for joining today. We want to thank um, Krista and Elizabeth and the whole enterprise team um, for the opportunity to join today and for their willingness to put on this training for all of our affordable housing partners in Ohio. Um, and really for, for enterprise, your longstanding partnership with us. Um, as many of you know, we have encouraged, incentivized, or required enterprise green standards and other green standards for um, more than a decade. And we really recognize and understand the importance of green building standards to the health and well being of the residents who um, live in the housing that we have the privilege to finance. We're also really grateful to be invited to be part of the 2020 Enterprise Green Communities Policy Working Group um, that worked on the development of these 2020 standards. Um, so can't share much of the credit, but you know, we'll, we'll take a little, uh, but really, um, last but not least, we want to thank all of our development partners, um, general contractors, industry architects, and all of our other partners that have joined us today. Um, we really feel that your expertise and involvement are critical to this very important work that we do. So thank you. Thank you both. I'm so glad to have you all here and, and share more of a local perspective. So thank you. And I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. Um, just a moment. Let's see. With some slides to, to kick us off. So um, as you all know, Enterprise is a national nonprofit in, in the housing space. And Green Communities is a program of enterprise. We're the only national green building program geared exclusively towards the affordable housing sector. And our goal is to help create housing that's not just affordable to purchase or to rent, but it's also healthy and efficient and environmentally responsible. And we try to do all of this within the cost constraints of the affordable market. Um, and we have 15 years of experience and success stories with, with all of you um, in doing this. We launched the most recent version of our Green Communities criteria this January. And after October 15th of this year, so in about three months, um, any new projects certifying with us will be required to use that new version, this 2020 criteria. So that's what we're here to talk with you all about um, this afternoon. So um, by the end of today's workshop, you should be able to understand what's required, recommended, and what shouldn't be overlooked with the 2020 criteria. You should be able to evaluate how different components of the 2020 criteria differ from standard practice, and you should be able to identify resources and steps to succeed. We've got um, a full afternoon planned for you all. Here's our agenda. Um, after this welcome and introductions, we'll go into different aspects of the 2020 criteria that you see here with integrative design, sensitive site protection, water quality and conservation, energy, resilience, healthy housing, and then end with certification how-to. We've built in two 10-minute breaks throughout um, the session, so we'll have a little, little bit of breathing room there too. And I'd like to just really share my appreciation for my colleagues who will be leading you through different 
sections um, of today's section of today's workshop, Shelby O'Neill, Megan and Venable Thomas, Frederick Zendel, and Lauren Westmoreland are all here on the line and will be um, leading different portions of today's workshop. So thank you. And so with that, I'm going to orient you to our 2020 criteria site. I'm going to put this in the chat box for you all. If you'd like to follow along um, yourself, if you go to this site, this is where you'll find our 2020 criteria. And I'm going to walk you through a few different aspects of it right now. So um, when you go to the 2020 criteria page, this is what you'll see in the beginning. And if you scroll down a little bit and look on the right side of your screen, you'll see this navigation bar and um, you'll be able to do several different things here. If you click on any of these different categories, you'll be able to access the full requirements, recommendations, and rationale for all of the criteria in the program. If you'd like to see a shorter version of this, you can just click on checklist here and you'll go to this checklist section where you have three different ways of looking at the checklist. Um, for the criteria. You can either look at an Excel version that you can download and edit on your computer and um, maximize the optional points for your project. You can download a PDF version of the checklist or down here you can actually work with an online interactive version of the checklist and you can click yes or no if you've um, been successful in your planning about integrating the mandatory criteria and you can also add in optional points um, if you're planning on seeking those with a particular project. And then over here on the right, you can see your progress being tracked here with this online checklist. So a lot of different ways to engage with material. And what I'd encourage all of you all to do also is to use these filters to make this material relevant for your particular situation. So if you click new construction, versus substantial rehab or mod rehab. Um, different criteria will disappear or appear that are relevant to your type, and you won't see what's not relevant to your type. And then same with rural or, or urban. So that's the filter, and that will affect both the checklist and the criteria content. And then there are just a couple of other things I wanna bring your attention to. And that's down here near the bottom. If you click on appendices, the first appendix includes the definitions for new construction, um, substantial rehab, mod rehab, urban and rural. So you can find that information there. With addenda and FAQ, we don't have any that are relevant um, to all Ohio projects yet, but we have an addenda there that's relevant to some. So we'll be updating that as we go along. So um, please keep an eye on that. And then down here at the very bottom, templates for certification, you'll be able to access the different materials that we'll ask you to submit when you're looking to certify your project. So um, take a look at this, become comfortable with the website, and we'd really encourage you all um, to use this tool to its full extent. So now I'm gonna do two other things and then hand it over to Shelby to get us started with the content. Um, the first thing is that we'd like to learn just a little bit more about who is on today's call. So we're going to do a quick exercise so you can see who else is in the room today that's working on similar projects to yours. So timing is going to be important here. So let's, let's do this together. So without clicking anything yet, hover over the reaction prompts at the bottom of your Zoom screen. You should see two. You should see a clapping icon and a thumbs up icon. And in a minute, I'll ask you to click one or the other. And then you can see by looking at all of our video screens who matches your project type. So let's give this a try. If you're working on a new construction project, press the thumbs up. Great, I see some thumbs popping up here. Great, and it'll fade away in just a minute. So. If you primarily work on rehabs, press the clapping icon. Awesome. Great. Now, if you're working mainly on rural projects, press the thumbs up. Let's see who's in that cohort. And then urban, if you're working more on urban projects, press, press the clap 
reaction. Great. Great. Okay. Thanks. That's really helpful. Um, and then the last thing we'll do here before getting started is we're going to be using the chat feature pretty liberally throughout today's session. We'd really encourage your Q&A. We'd like to keep that scrolling um, over on the side throughout today's workshop. And we're really looking forward to learning um, from you all just as much as we're sharing out. So let's take a moment to just try out the chat function. And um, what we'll use as a prompt is going to be a pretty simple one. Um, if you could just share where are you working from today, that would be helpful. So I'm going to put in the question and then I'm going to answer my kitchen table. And if you all could just type in where you're working from today so we can get an idea of that and you can all get some experience chatting. That'd be great. So we've got some home offices side room office apartment kitchen living room dining room bedroom front porch Ooh, i'd like to be outside right now partially empty office apartment great great thanks so we'll keep this chat active and um thanks so much for joining today and um with all the different skill sets that we have on the line today from architects to developers green building consultants policymakers, financiers, I think we're really going to have a, a deep, um, a deep session today. So thank you all so much for joining and I'll turn it over to Shelby to kick us off with the next section. Thanks, Krista. Great. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Shelby O'Neill and um, I help lead the certification program. I'm based out of DC, but um, Zooming in today from Massachusetts. Uh, it's great to see all of your faces and I see a lot of familiar names. So um, pleased that you're able to join us today. Uh, to kick off the criteria content of uh, today's session, let me just share my screen. <clears throat> Great. We're going to spend the next 20 minutes um, focusing on integrative design uh, and specifically reinforcing the impact of integrative design, familiarizing ourselves with the project priorities survey, uh, which is a new comprehensive activity as part of the 2020 certification process, and uh, reviewing new opportunities to engage deeply with certain integrative design topics within category one. Um, as we know that community outreach is important uh, in Ohio. So um, to start from resilience to water, health, and performance, really whatever your project is focused on, integrative design is the backbone of the criteria. Um, we know that implementing an integrative design process can determine the success of a project. Um, and this is only more critical in 2020 as the affordable housing industry reaches for greater performance in their projects and greater health and wellness benefits for residents and all the while maintaining project budgets. Uh, I'll share a quick case example. Uh, one project team that we know after participating in an intensive integrative design charrette as part of actually Enterprise's Affordable Housing Design Leadership Institute um, in Boston, our partner Homeowners Rehab shared that this integrative charrette pushed the development team to view their project with a more holistic approach to reclaim their space and create a transformative impact on the community. And while initially struggling to meet their programmatic requirements and community needs for the project, after engaging in a holistic design process, the developers shared that they were able to focus way more on who they serve, the residents, and how they can make it a better life for them in the building. So the concept and general objectives of an integrative design process are the same in 2020 as previous iterations of the criteria. Uh, we're asking teams to engage in a holistic approach to pre-design by prioritizing information gathering uh, and the resident and surrounding community experience. We're asking teams to set goals for building performance and resident health and comfort and in therefore to encourage buy-in and accountability from project team members. Uh, we know again that community outreach is a priority in Ohio, so to support teams uh, and engaging in a meaningful process 
we're amplifying it with a new, more comprehensive activity and tool as part of the credit uh, 2020 process. Um, before we elaborate on this fancy new tool, uh, I'd like to take a quick poll to understand the experience level uh, that we have here today with integrative design. Let's see, uh, Gabby, are you able to share the first poll? So go ahead and plug in your answer. Please share your level of experience with integrative design. Awesome. <clears throat> All right, numbers are coming in. We have about 50% respond rate, bleh, response rate. Um, looks like, okay, I'll report out on some results. Gabby, if you wanna close us out in just like three more seconds. Um, and yep. while I'm doing that, oh, super. 66% <clears throat> in, it looks like we have about a third of you um, have experience uh, providing direct benefits uh, for stakeholders as it that was a direct outcome of your integrative design process. Uh, looks like maybe a quarter of us have engaged and a number of us, uh, a little more than a third, um, need more guidance. Uh, great. So with that, I'm going to um, let my colleague Megan talk more specifically about the tools that we're hoping will guide you uh, in integrative design work for the 2020 criteria. And uh, while I'm doing that, I'm going to share a link to this tool, the Project Priority Survey. Take it away, Megan. Thanks, Shelby. Um, so as we know, affordable housing developments are special. Um, and they're an expression of what we care about most in society, which is providing for our most vulnerable creating a community asset and bringing something beautiful to our city. And over the last couple of years, the people and institutions involved in housing production have really raised the bar on what it means to design and build public and affordable housing. And we're seeing high quality projects that fit seamlessly into their respective neighborhoods and contribute to the community in exciting new ways. A few of the projects we've worked, worked on and some that, uh, that were just mentioned are really you know distinguished from market rate buildings um which is our goal you know we want to be raising the bar um, with a market rate building there's often the pressure to reduce costs to maximize short-term profits resulting in lower quality buildings and spaces but with affordable housing because there isn't a same profit motive you have a set budget you can actually get a lot more value for residents and the community out of a building some of the most successful developers demonstrate it's not just about designing a project and getting it built. It's also about creating a vision and bringing it to life for the people who are going to occupy the space. Community engagement is an important part of creating and fulfilling that vision. You don't just go into community and say, here's the project. You engage people early on. You ask, what do you care about in your neighborhood? What's important to you? What are the problems and the opportunities? And we've seen that when that happens, there's always something that comes out of that process that makes the project better. So the goal is not to make your very busy lives busier, but to produce more equitable, impactful projects that are informed by many of our most knowledgeable voices on resident needs, and that's residents. So this is a really a, a tool to support developers in doing so and to supplement many of your already deep engagement processes. So as mentioned in the poll, many of you have some integrative design experience. Um, this is to help supplement that. Uh, a, a key component to integra integrative design is quality engagement. And so this survey is to help you better build the capacity to do that. And so for folks who haven't been able to experience that yet, this will help you do that. So um, the PPS, if you go back to the last slide, can be found in Appendix B to be completed prior to beginning your integrative design process. Um, and you submit this with your pre-build application in the Green Communities online portal. But you can also reference the link here in the chat if you guys wanna drop that PPS, I think you already have it. Um, so if you wanna click on that link to the survey, I'll drop it again so it can be a little easier and pull that up. 
you can see if you go back to the last slide. Um, right. Yeah. So these are the main headings of the PPS that you'll see in that survey. Um, so first, we want to identify the population served, which is really helping us to ID, ID the unique populations of this development. If we know who we're serving, it's easier to align our mission to that. Um, resident experience, uh, resident as expert experience is next, and I'll dig a little bit more into that in a moment. Um, identifying resident opportunity factors is next. So that really helps us, and we have a, uh, an amazing database that we pulled together called Opportunity 360 that talks about all the many pieces or components of lived experience that impact people's lives and ability to succeed um, and have access to opportunity. So we understand that housing is important, but also uh, education, health, well-being, mobility, and economic security. And so this portion allows you to dig a little bit deeper into the data, the metrics, to understand how those key components will impact your development and just give you a more robust understanding of how your uh, development can incorporate some of this understanding. Next, understanding building emissions, housing, is a foundation for health and quality of life. And so project design, development, operations, and management, as well as programs, play a significant role in influencing the health and cultural resilience outcomes for your residents. And so you really want to be able to understand what the climate impact of your building is going to be. And this is going to help you walk through to better understand that as well. And then climate and environmental resilience. This is a, check, a checklist really to help you think about the resilient design of your building to minimize the impact on residents and local community members. And then lastly, your project mission. Um, this mission is a statement about how your project will achieve the goals that you, uh, that you want for community and in service to, to where this building will be developed. Um, your mission guides your impact. And so with a clear mission through understanding all these different components, you can uh, ensure better impact for your building um, in general. Next slide, please. And so I want to focus a little bit on resident expert experience um, because this really digs deeper into our engagement process. So at a minimum, you have to have one conversation or more with a resident, a potential resident or community member. You have one conversation with a current building management or resident service staff member who has regular interactions with building residents in one of your existing buildings. In new construction projects that don't have building management staff, which many of you may be doing, you speak with building managers or resident service staff of similar local projects or local community members um, and residents who are engaged in your community around where you will be developing. First, you want to be able to have community reflection and understanding. So this helps you understand the context of your affordable housing development. And that's critical to ensuring that it successfully meets the needs of residents and aligns with your intended project goals. Next, you want to ground truth that. So what forms of feedback have you used or will you use for input from residents or target users to inform your priorities for this project? So how does what you are thinking as an expert align with those other experts who are residents um, and how is this informed in, inform your priorities for the project? And then last, the comprehensive community design. How does what you've learned inform the design process and the features? So how does all of this actually come through into the design of your building? And so this really creates a much more robust or comprehensive approach to community engagement that allows you to step-by-step step place that engagement back into informing the design of your project. So with that, um, we'd like to have a little question uh, or a little feedback, little conversation. How do you think you could incorporate these steps into your integrative design practice today? Um, so you see that question in the chat. Many of you have said you've had great, uh, you've already used integrative design before. Perhaps that integrative design um, has, has included really robust engagement. Let us know. Let's share about that. Um, what have you already done or how could this potentially help you um, incorporate some different uh, practices into what you already do?
And Megan, maybe to get the conversation rolling here, I wonder if you have any ideas about when groups should engage their community with this. Yeah, um, I would say now. Um, you, it's never too early to be developing relationships. I think ultimately, right, engagement is about trust building. Um, engagement is about connection. Um, and so even if you're not developing, getting feedback from people or you're building it, you're not even in your process yet, getting feedback from people on what they want to see in community, what needs want to be met in community that aren't already help you can help you to integrate new ideas into how your building can um, serve the community. Um, and so I'd love to hear even some of what folks are already doing that they think has been useful to share with um, to share with other folks on the on the call. Um, so Michael Melko said, we've done early resident meetings to let residents know we're rehabbing their communities eventually, but that we're not exactly sure what we're going to do yet. So we ask them to write down their requests and concerns on handouts that we collect them and distribute to our architects once we hired them. Yeah, that's great, right? Like you haven't even done anything yet, but already um, you're starting that process. And so being able to hear from folks, being able to prepare yourselves for how you might even start to do that type of further engagement as you uh, begin your design process is, is great. Any more? Maybe a couple more folks. Yeah, Whitney says, we work with neighborhood advisory committees who give input about where and what they would like to see developed in their neighborhood. That's awesome. Um, we're going to talk a little bit more about um, about 1.7, which is cultural strengthening cultural resilience. And in within that, we have a cultural advisory group show, showing you how to build a cultural advisory group. Advisory committee, committees are awesome because they bring forward a complexity and a di diversity of representation across your community that helps you have an even fuller conversation around what folks want to see what they know and have seen happening in their communities um, and the types of programming that's already existing to address some of those projects that you could incorporate in your development as well. Um, so that's awesome. Thank you guys for sharing. Um, if any more things come up, please drop them in the chat and we'd be happy to discuss them. Um, but with for that, we're going to go ahead and move on. Um, so Shelby, if you want to take it away. Awesome. Thanks, Megan. That was great. Uh, so we're going to take the next few minutes and walk through some key uh, other category one integrative design criteria at a high level. Um, so here goes. Um, so really to support integrative design, um, there are some new process changes and criteria in place. Uh, I'd like to just highlight these two. Uh, first being Criterion 1.2, charrettes and coordination meetings. Um, it really employs the findings from the process Megan described with the PPS to uh, then execute effective meetings for a successful collaborative integrative design process by prioritizing uh, the appropriate collaborative meeting formats and activities for with uh, as part of the 2020 process, we're offering guidance um, on these types of meetings and asking for a little bit more accountability to encourage success by requiring teams uh, share a collaborative meetings template with us uh, when they submit for pre-build. And then the next criteria, criterion 1.4 that I'd like to highlight is um, construction management. So we all know that it's you know generally necessary to communicate uh, project priorities with practitioners on site, but uh, through this new criterion, we're really asking um, teams to be more intentional and develop an explicit education plan to ensure that those on site understand their role um, in achieving all of the project objectives. Uh, so for this item, for certification, we'll look to see your project's education plan. Uh, and then Megan, there, I think, as you said, there's one more that you'll speak to here. Yeah, so um, really thinking more about resilient communities, strengthening cultural resilience is a component of that. 
And that's um, drawing from inherent strength prioritization of cultural resilience engagement and strategies. So this is almost the like community engagement plus um, thinking a little bit more deeply about how do you actually lift up the cultural components of folks and residents in your community that will be living in your development. Um, so our, we specifically focus on an inclusive process that enables the project to be more reflective of community needs and benefits. And I think investing in trust building with community can, can help to mitigate community objection and create momentum for future development processes. Um, so this marks the first edition of the criteria to specifically promote resident participation, cultural leadership, and community buy-in in affordable housing projects through key cultural strategies um, as part of the design development and community planning process. So one, the cultural resilience assessment helps you to reflect um, on and ensure the local and cultural context of a project is incorporated and encourage a more inclusive and culturally relevant development process for equitable project outcomes. Um, and so it's a step-by-step -step assessment that helps you think a little bit more about that. And then the cultural advisory group, which I kind of mentioned earlier, helps to ensure a broad cultural stakeholder input that helps create spaces that are unique, reflective of resident cultures and representative of community values, which also helps, right, to build more of a foundation between you as a community cultural partner and other community cultural partners who have existed and worked in your community for a really long time, um, which not only benefits you, but benefits your residents and benefits like the longevity, sustainability and resilience of your building. So uh, with that, I'll pass it back to Shelby uh, to kind of close out this section. Awesome, thanks Megan. It's really exciting to be able to share about our first uh, specific cultural resilience criterion in the 2020 material. So quick recap, we've covered the 2020 approach to integrative design at a high level, oriented you a little bit to the project priorities survey, which is really the biggest change uh, since 2015 in this category, and then highlighter, highlighted, excuse me, um, these other new criteria to help reinforce uh, your engagement in successful integrative design practices. Uh, rather than pause to answer questions, I'd like to just encourage folks to write in their questions as we go, and um, our brilliant team member, Lauren, will uh, either respond or we'll stockpile them and get back to you um, now or throughout the conversation. And with that, uh, Frederick, why don't you go ahead and introduce the next topic? Sure, thank you, Shelby. And thank you everyone who participated in that last uh, category. It's really great to hear um, how you're working with communities. So my name is Frederick Zindel. I am a program officer here at Enterprise. I work out of our New York City office but right now I'm in my bedroom. Um, and in this section, we're gonna be talking about sensitive site protection. We'll review the importance of environmental considerations as part of site selection. We'll introduce our ecological resource protection zones and how they are used um, as part of the certification process. And we'll engage in a quick breakout activity. Um, and I'm gonna pass it back to Shelby who will lead the, the meat of this discussion. Thanks, Frederick. I appreciate you teeing us up. So site protection. Um, with the acknowledgement that we're really living the increasing impacts of climate change, um, it's imperative to conserve natural resources, protect ecosystems, and reduce flooding uh, while developing affordable housing. The 2020 criteria includes now more specific requirements for limiting development to curtail negative impact on sensitive lands and to frame this work, we're now designating these sensitive lands ecological resource protection zones, or as we uh, affectionately refer to them now, ERPs. Um, and we're now asking teams to develop with a sharper focus on four ecological features or ERPs, um, those being the 100 year floodplain, so limiting new development within the 100 year floodplain. Uh, aquatic ecosystems, so conserving and protecting aquatic ecosystems, including wetlands, by identifying these on site and not developing within 100 feet of these areas. Uh, habitat, so avoiding developing in areas that contain habitat for plant and animal species identified as threatened or endangered, and 
uh, not extending the building, built structures, roads, or parking areas into these uh, designated areas. And finally, agricultural soils, conserving agricultural soils by protecting farmland, uh, unique farmland, and farmland of statewide or local importance. So um, those should all be familiar from 2015, but uh, as we frame them as ERPs in the 2020 criteria, teams are now uh, asked to document these uh, specifically within their site using an ERPs map. So uh, what is an ERPs map and why are we using them? Um, <clears throat> understanding these ecological features on your site at the start of the development process enables more sensitive development practices um, that are aimed at reducing the harmful impacts on our environment. And an ERPs map really enables clear understanding uh, and communication about the project site by really specifically documenting these boundaries uh, of these areas on site plans in a way that, that we haven't done before. Uh, and it also clearly illustrates if any herbs fall inside the perimeter of the site to determine what, if any, features are on site and um, if they need to be treated sensitively. And finally, and maybe more broadly, but um, this practice we think encourages awareness around these sensitive features and more familiarity uh, documenting these can foster uh, more sensitive development processes in the long term. So um, now Frederick's going to take us through how to use an ERPS to certify. Yes, thank you, Shelby. Um, right, so as Shelby mentioned, all the, the um, four ecological resource protection zones, um, we're going to require, if any of those are present, we're going to require an ERPS map. So you would just follow the guidance and the criteria, which lays it out a little more specifically um, and provide us with a map that illustrates uh, the ecological resource areas present on your site. Um, so with that said, if there are no um, ecological resource protection zones or ERPs um, present on your site, the only thing you need to do to comply with criterion 2.1 is to submit a traditional site plan which was the same in 2015, um, and that should demonstrate your connections to existing infrastructure. And when it comes to site, we do ask teams to err on the side of inclusion. Um, if there's any question as to whether sensitive features are present or will be impacted, um, sharing more information may help communicate your site features clearly, leading to a collective understanding of your project's compliance pathway for certification. And then one final tip um, in addressing site constraints is to do them early. Uh, let us know as early as you can in the certification process um, because that can offer more opportunity for collaborative resolution if an issue exists. So um, I'm going to take a moment now just to continue, all, or to, continue to encourage you all to ask your questions as we go along um, in the chat box. Um, but I'm going to tee us up for our breakout session. So this breakout session is intended to familiarize us all with ERPS maps for certification. There will be four breakout rooms. Each group will receive a sample ERPS representing one of the four ecological functions Shelby spoke about earlier. Um, excuse me. Uh, once in your room with your facilitator, which will be either Lauren, Krista, Shelby, or myself, we will, um, you'll review and discuss the ERPS map and respond to the prompts that will be provided. One person from your group should volunteer to take notes, um, and that person will report out uh, once we come back to the big group. Um, some main key points you all discussed in, uh, in your conversations. So before we go into the rooms, there are three prompts that were just shared in the chat box. Those are uh, designed to get you talking about your ERPS map um, and can help get your discussion started. So Gabby, if you could throw us all into four breakout rooms, that'd be great.
Hi, everyone that's still in this room. Um, you should have received a message on your screen asking you to join the breakout room. Has anyone not received that message? Hi, Gabriella from Gabriella. Yeah, I just, <laughs> I just saw the message. I have an applicant in the office, so I'm going to join over there. Okay, awesome. Thank you. Mm -hmm.
welcome back, everybody. Um, I hope that conversation was really good for you all. Just getting set up here to include this. Um, so, so now we're going to take just about five minutes, a few minutes here to go through each group and hear what y'all discussed. Um, so if we can start with Prime Farmland, someone from Krista's group or Krista, if you want to share out what you, what y'all discussed, I'd love to hear it for the group. Yeah, I'll start off by saying that we talked a little bit about like why we're minimizing development on prime farmland to preserve that for potential future use. Um, we also talked about how preserving the farmland in a sense could be the same as preserving open space for recreation, for instance, on a site. Um, and then at the end, we got cut off in our conversation as we were coming back here um, and talking about what type of easements might need to be purchased. And um, we don't have a particular um, distance requirement around where the easements on land that you might be purchasing should be in relation to the site. It, we'd prefer that it be closer, but there aren't any um, specific hard and fast rules around that. But if anybody else from my group wants to add anything, that'd be great. Give a couple I think seconds. you pretty much covered it, Krista. Thank okay, you. Thanks. Fantastic. Great. So now we'll move on to my group. Um, we worked on floodplain. Benjamin, would you like to share out? Thank you for taking notes for us. Appreciate it. Sure thing. So uh, the uh, big problem we identified here is that the 100-year floodplain uh, crosses a portion of the site. And if you look closely, it actually crosses the footprint of the building uh, as proposed itself. So uh, the really the prime, primary way we would mitigate that is by reorienting the building on the site to avoid that, uh, that portion of the floodplain, that there's some uh, other land off to the west, uh, over in the east, that perhaps if the building could be uh, moved around or slightly reshaped, that that would be the best way to avoid building on that 100-year floodplain. Uh, we also had some, uh, some discussion about other kinds of mitigating techniques, which probably aren't called for here, such as detention ponds. Um, someone was mentioning a project they had done where they uh, used permeable, uh, pervious pavement uh, in the parking lot to act as sort of a secondary uh, drain for stormwater. Uh, but here, the, we're, the recommendation would probably be to try to reorient the building to avoid the floodplain altogether. Thank you, Benjamin. And I, I want to point out for that project that was brought up, it was located in New Jersey that started out not on a floodplain and then Hurricane Sandy hit. And uh, then all of a sudden their project was in a floodplain. So that was really interesting challenge to um, talk about and so thank you for sharing that story and sharing out for us Benjamin. Um, now let's go to Lauren. Anyone from your group want to speak about aquatic ecosystems? I'll start and then if anyone from my group wants to jump in please feel free. So we talked about this map a little bit um, and discussed uh, some of the potential ways it could be improved to communicate information better um, ensuring that that things on the site are well labeled so that those of us who are doing the certification can ensure that we know what these things are. Um, when we were talking a little bit about um, the actual aquatic ecosystems, there was the question regarding who determines which ecosystems. And as a reminder, make sure to go to Enterprise Green Communities, the online criteria. Um, and in this case, it's the US Army Corps of Engineers. And we've also seen information come back from engineers as well from their own uh, State Department of um, Environmental Protection. And then the last discussion that we got into that we did not get to finish is um, someone mentioned that they are coming across a lot of new construction sites that are bordering up against um, potential uh, wetlands and then sort of thinking about how to deal with that um, and the question of do we just avoid these sites um, and then 
you know, there's, I think there's options that have already been brought up about reorientation and, and, and that type of stuff. Yeah. Anybody else from Lauren's group want to add to that? No? All right, so we'll move on to the last group. Um, Shelby, would you or someone from your group like to share out about conserving habitat? Um, I'll start. Um, we had a brief discussion about conserving the endangered box turtle habitat. Um, a little difficulty loading our map, so um, our time was reduced, and I apologize to the team for that, but um, I think we recognized that uh, the site did not overlap with the habitat and uh, started to discuss what other information could be shared before uh, we rejoined the large group. Um, so. Feel free to add if others have comments, but I think we could also move on and wrap up. Um, just looking yeah. at the clock here. Yeah. So, um, yeah, Shelby, do you want to wrap us up if nobody else has anything to say? All right. Um, well, uh, thanks everyone. We hope you're leaving this section of uh, the criteria over you, overview with a reinforced understanding of sensitive site protection and the benefits of ERPS mapping, how to use an ERPS to communicate sensitive features on your site uh, if it looks like your project may include one, and also familiarity with an ERPS um, after this great breakout exercise that Frederick walked us through. Um, we'll now go ahead and take a 10 minute break actually, um, and folks should feel free to turn off cameras um, and get a little air. <laughs> so we'll get started back again at um, about 2.10. So see you all in a few minutes. Great.
Hello, everybody. And welcome back. I'm just going to give just one more minute and then we'll get started on water. Okay. Well, I hope you all enjoyed your breaks. Um, I know I did a few jumping jacks and moved around to loosen up a little bit. So I hope you all got water for the water conversation or got to move around and look outside the window a little bit. Um, so let's get started with water. So uh, water quality and conservation practices impact our health and well-being. Um, our property operating expenses and is a limited precious resource. Um, lead pipes were banned in systems in 19, in new systems in 1986. And yet, according to a study by the American Water Works Association, nearly a third of US water systems still contain lead service lines in 2016. Enterprise Green Communities has consistently required an incentivized water conservation our 2020 criteria is now allowing more flexibility in achieving these measures through a calculator approach rather than a prescriptive path. Additionally, we are expanding our focus to include water quality with both mandatory and optional pathways. Um, so before we get started, I would like to show you where the water calculator is on our website. So I'm just going to quickly share. So if you go to our 2020 website that Krista walked through earlier, up here in this little, I like to call it a burger, um, you'll click that and scroll down to templates for certification. And here it is, you can download it right there. Um, and let me go back to my slides. And I'm sharing that link in the chat if you wanna go ahead and open it up and download it and play around with it while, um, and ask any questions while I'm uh, talking, please feel free to do so. So 4.1 is our water conservation mandatory criterion where we require all projects projects to reduce water consumption by at least 20% compared to baseline. Prior to 2020, um, as I mentioned before, we had a prescriptive path to water conservation by specifying flow rates and water sense labels for each fixtures, each fixture in the project. So now we are continuing to require that all new fixtures be water sense labeled, but there is a lot more flexibility in flow rates as long as they meet the 20% reduction. So you'll show this compliance through our calculator, which I shared with you. And this has been updated from 2015 to 2020 to take into account the people living in the building. You're further incentivized to um, earn for more greater water conservation uh, once you reach the 30% threshold. Um, and at that point, you can start earning additional points. So for 4.3, um, this is a very, this is a brand new criterion um, and focus on water quality. So for this criterion, there are three focus areas. Um, that is to replace lead, line ser lead service lines, which is mandatory for substantial rehab projects built before 1986. Um, you develop a Legionella water management program to be included in the operating manual under 8.1. This one is required for multifamily buildings uh, with either a cooling tower, hot water system, or more than 10 stories in height. And then our optional measure for all projects is testing the water from dwelling unit faucets. Our website and criteria manual go into greater detail on how to comply, um, but we want to give you a high level overview of the requirements and changes under this category. Um, so before we wrap up this section, there are just two quick poll questions that I want to sh uh, have you all answer. Um, Gabby, if you don't mind sharing the first one. Mm -hmm. 
Fantastic. If it looks like a majority of people answered, please show the results. All right, everyone got it correct. I was wondering if we'd have any jokesters answer Mars, um, but I'm glad y'all were took that or knew the answer to that. And then if you could do the second question, it's a little trickier. All right. And Gabby, I'll leave it up to you if it looks like most people answered. Fantastic. The correct answer is water quality. Um, water qu calculator is a very close second, so um, I could see how you all could think that. But the newest criterion is water quality, and our water calculator was updated from 2015 to 2020. So. Thank you all for participating in that. Um, I'm going to hand it back to Krista to continue the programming on carbon themes and energy standards. Great, thank you, Frederick. I'm gonna share um, that criteria site with you all again. We're gonna focus in on, on category five this time. So um, within this, category within category five operating energy of the 2020 criteria we're going to look at this uh, concept of the path to zero that we've included for the first time how to consider that with your projects and then to dive deep into some of the mandatory requirements here so in the united states buildings uh, residential and commercial buildings account for about 40 percent of energy consumption and significantly contribute to greenhouse gas emissions. So the choices that we make when we're designing, constructing, operating our buildings dictate that impact. Um, and in the 2020 criteria, we're including strategies to have a lighter footprint, um, not for the sake of the earth, but for the sake of us, the people who are, who are living in the earth. And particularly as the impacts of our changing climate disproportionately affect people who are already systemat systematically disadvantaged, including people with low incomes and communities of color. So the 2020 criteria prioritizes the reduction of emissions by introducing new strategies and by introducing a new plus level um, certification so that we can push investment in, in deep levels of energy efficiency. So, um, our goal is to reduce the amount of energy required to operate the building and then if possible move to clean energy sources um, so that we are providing environmental benefits improving conditions for resident health and lowering property operating expenses so if you are familiar with the uh, previous versions of green communities you'll know that this category five used to be called energy efficiency and now it's operating energy because we are trying to better recognize the impact that efficiency strategies have as well as renewables and we've included a new optional criteria actually in category seven about reducing embodied emissions so focusing here on on operating energy so let's take a look at the path to zero diagram that you should be able to see in the in the top left of your screen here on the criteria page. I'll try to make it a little bit bigger for you all. Um, so the 2020 criteria contains the three essential strategies on this path to zero. First, there's the path towards reducing emissions associated with the building uh, through energy efficiency, then reducing a building's emissions through the type of energy that you're using, and then third, reducing a building's emissions embodied in the materials that are used to construct the property. So we'll start at the beginning with Criterion 5.1. 5.1, either A or B, is mandatory for all projects. New construction projects will follow 5.1A, and certified Energy Star, while rehabs of existing buildings will follow 5.1B and meet a certain threshold of, of building performance. And the reason that you see 5.1a grayed out on my screen here is because my filter is selected for the rehab type project. So just want to 
call that out. Um, and then after complying with the mandatory criterion, projects can choose how far along they'd like to take. They'd like to go on this path to zero. Choosing 5-2, A or B will lead to a more efficient building. 5-3, A or B adds renewable energy sources. And then 5-4 combines the two concepts, uh, directing projects to be designed to, to zero energy. Then we go on to 5-5, five, five, A and B, which take another step forward in the name of electrification. And all electric properties source operating emissions will be no worse than the emissions associated with the electric grid. Um, and as grid sources become cleaner, so will the emissions profile of, of the property. So even if installing renewables is not financially feasible or you have space constraints in regards to that today, um, building your property in a way so that it's all electric ready could be a mechanism to ensure that um, your property is preparing for future electrification. So along this path to zero, you'll note that there are advanced levels of energy efficiency tied to advanced measures to control moisture. So you see this first asterisk here um, associated with 5.2a. Um, all properties choosing to comply with that optional criteria will be required to follow our dehumidification criteria. Um, and then also you'll note this other um, aspect here of our plus level of certification that those projects will be designed and recognized for this exemplary effort by a new tier of certification called Enterprise Green Community Certification Plus. So it's the first time we're actually demarcating levels of certification with green communities and this higher tier will be associated with those projects that do everything that's required of certifying to green communities and also go deep in terms of um, energy efficiency and renewables to being designed to be zero energy. So let's take a closer look at the first two criteria here, 51A and 51B, and look at the requirements. Um, as I mentioned earlier, 51A properties are required, are, are new construction. So I'll, I'll click my filter so that you all can see this. So all new construction properties are required to certify to Energy Star and then also report out on their emissions and their energy use intensity. And I'll get back to that in a second. All rehabs, whether substantial or moderate, um, are required to instead of certifying to Energy Star, follow either an ERI or an ASHRAE path to achieve a certain level of energy efficiency. And then, this is particularly new for the 2020 criteria, also um, conduct some commissioning. So compartmentalization, insulation installation, and HVAC installation, depending on the scope of work of your property. And then just like the new construction properties, these buildings are also required, let me scroll back up where it says it at the top, um, to report out on their EUI and emissions like the new construction properties are as well. So those are, those are the requirements. Um, and then we have a slew of optional criteria for you all. But I want to um, show you a little bit more about how to tackle this new question in green communities about reporting out on energy use intensity, EUI, and emissions. So I'm gonna take you to the templates part of our webpage like Frederick did for the water calculator. And what you'll see here in this section right here is that we have um, a large bullet for building performance standard templates. And then there are lots of different options. <laughs> so we've customized templates depending on the type of project that you have. So if you have a new construction project, you'll use one of these. If you have a rehab project, you'll use one of these. And you pick which one, um, depending on which type of energy modeling um, or prescriptive path that you'll be using. So I'm actually going to pretend that I have a project that's new construction following the ERI path. And I'm gonna share with you all um, that template and point out a few different things. So here we are. This is the Excel template for new construction projects that have chosen to follow the ERI path or, or do it HERS modeling. What you'll see first on this page is this green instructions box that just tells you 
reminds you where you are, uh, which form you're using, and what to fill out and submit for pre-build versus the post-build stage of certification. And then the bottom part of this instructions highlights if you want to pursue some optional criteria in this category, you can also use this form to do that too. It'll actually make those calculations for you. You just have to check and see if you're in compliance. So I encourage you to take some time to read this if you have a project that'll be using this form. And then if we go down the page here, you'll see there's a key. So the green cells are instructions, the yellow cells are where you input data, and then the gray cells are calculating information for you all. Um, I'm about to go into some things that aren't gonna make a lot of sense to some of you all on the line who don't deal with energy models every day. And on the other hand, if you do deal with energy models every day, I'm sure you want more detail than I'm about to share with you. So put all of those questions wanting more detail or less Less detail in the chat box and we'll try to handle this for you. But what I just want to point out is that when you're doing ERI models, you are ascertaining how much energy the residential units will use. If we're trying to get project level emissions and energy use intensity, we've also got to take a look at the spaces in the building that aren't residential units. So we've uh, designed this calculator to help you do that without doing additional energy modeling. So in this form, you'd fill out the project information, um, location, for instance, um, an address, and then you'd fill out some basic information about energy information here. And then we're gonna scroll all the way down to the bottom where you'll see fields available for you um, for every building in your property to input just the size, the condition floor area, and this number of stories for any buildings that you have. And then um, we'll, we'll calculate almost everything else for you. Um, at pre-build, you'll also put in the HERS or the ERI scores for each of your unique unit types. This is really similar to the sampling form that you've seen in the past, but now we're gonna be using this information to calculate additional outputs for you. And then at post-build, um, you'll report on the actual um, confirmed energy usage here. We've also integrated a feature so you don't have to enter in the addresses of all of your units multiple times. If you enter them in here, we'll pull them over for you. So um, that's just a snapshot, a high level um, of this one template that will calculate your EUI and your emissions information for you based upon um, information from your energy models and EPA's power profiler. So when you actually put numbers in this form, these fields will be calculated for you and you'll just write them into the certification portal so we can track what you have. Um, we don't have a target for emissions. We're just looking to see what your emissions are. Um, so I'm gonna stop sharing this. And um, and go back um, to the main section here. So that's, that's a high level overview of what our requirements are in 2020 with energy efficiency 5.1, what optional opportunities you have in the path to zero, and then how to select the correct template and an example of what's included in a template for calculating the EUI and emissions information. So I'm gonna pause here um, and see what questions may have come in during the chat um, that we should go over in the next few minutes or so before going on to the next section. Lauren, is there anything we should cover as a group? I think um, one great question that came up is where in the process should energy modelers be hired? Before yeah. plans are drawn, during construction, and or post-construction, all three. So if you want to talk a little bit about that. Yeah, thanks. So we say the earlier, the better. You know, the idea is not to necessarily use your energy modeling just as a compliance mechanism in the system, but actually to help you design your building <laughs> so that it's going to be efficient, that your residents are going to be able to like be comfortable in the hot summers and the cold winters <laughs> and that your bills are gonna be able to be reasonable. So if you bring in your energy modeler early in the process, they'll actually be able to play around with different components of your building to suggest you know, what meets your 
your budget for your project, what meets your design aesthetic, and what actually also results in an energy efficient building. So it's really important to bring them in early. And even if you don't agree with me that you'd like to use them to help design your property, it's really critical if you're certifying to Energy Star. Um, if you don't bring them in early enough, you could miss a critical step of that process and be kind of locked out from certification. So um, um, I don't want to overwhelm the, the chat box here, but if there are energy modelers on the line today, if you want to type your name into the chat box now so that developers who are looking to find an energy modeler partner could identify you, we could go ahead and do that, but happy to answer any other questions too. All right, well, without seeing any right now, I'll just wrap up this section by um, highlighting some of the big differences between 2015 and 2020 in that all new construction or projects are required to certify to Energy Star, and Energy Star has changed a little bit over the past few years, and then all rehabs are also required to do commissioning. So, um, happy to answer any questions as we move on about this and over the next weeks and months as you spend more time in the templates. So, with that, I'll go ahead and turn it over to Shelby for resilience. Awesome. Thanks, Krista. I'll go ahead and get my slides up here. Great. <clears throat> All right. Uh, so shifting our focus to a related subject, um, but a central theme of the 2020 criteria uh, resilience and we'll spend this next session together and I will provide an overview of opportunities in the 2020 criteria for teams to prioritize resilience and amplify uh, their resilience strategies in nearly all eight categories of the criteria and then uh, we'll be able to point you in the direction of tools and resources available to use for addressing your uh, projects, climate vulnerabilities, and to design more durable projects. <clears throat> so, uh, we know that disasters, meaning weather, uh, loss of power, uh, health pandemic like we're experiencing now um, as well as gradual and chronic threats like extreme heat um, all disproportionately impact more vulnerable communities and often communities of color so the need for well-built healthy affordable housing for residents during and after a disaster and to lift up resident voices and encourage community resilience is urgent. Um, I'm sharing on the screen here an excerpt from the 2020 Criteria Ambassador Brief, which is available on our um, Green Communities website. And the brief summarizes all of the central themes of the criteria. Um, and this so slide specifically looks at sort of the expansive and interdisciplinary approach to resilience um, that the 2020 criteria has incorporated. Um, and also lists out some of the key mandatory and optional criteria offered uh, for project teams to really actualize uh, their resilient design goals. Um, to get us sort of thinking in this realm, I'd like to just prompt a chat. Um, and it looks like Lauren's got it covered. Um, what are the climate hazards where, that you're typically seeing in your projects in Ohio? Um, feel free to just jump in and share. 
Um, and as folks are responding, I'll move us along for a minute and then come back to the chat. Um, with regard to resilience in the 2020 criteria, um, the topic is not siloed in one resilience category uh, because rather it's throughout the entire criteria, we've been able to sharpen uh, strategies to really prioritize resilience and habitability um, in different disciplines uh, such that affordable housing residents uh, can benefit before, during, and after a disaster. Um, for instance, you'll see on the uh, menu on the side of this slide here that um, from category one to three, four, five, and eight, um, we're seeing a lot of opportunities to engage. Uh, for instance, um, we've enhanced our surface stormwater management uh, requirement and opportunity to go further in category three. Um, also provided more guidance um, for accessing potable water during emergencies in category four, category five that Krista just spoke to. A lot of opportunities there, you know, moving to zero carbon and um, framing the conversation about going all electric uh, and um, flood proofing as part of resilient energy systems. So these are just a few. Uh, we encourage you to really get familiar and cozy with all of the criteria. Um, and I'm just gonna go ahead and take a look at some of the feedback we've seen, we've received to see uh, what we're looking at in Ohio. <clears throat> oh, great, lots of sharing. So oh, risks and vulnerabilities from flooding, uh, water inside and water outside, gotcha. <laughs> Poor soils, air quality, hurricane winds. Wow, long-term and acute shocks. Yeah, okay. Feel free to keep sharing as you think of things. You know, it's really helpful to hear from you all. Um, whether to include a generator in case of power outages. Right, yeah. Um, actually have a pathway for backup power. Super, thanks so much everyone. Um, so again, just trying to illustrate sort of the extent to which um, these issues impact projects and the ways that the criteria is responding. For today, I'm gonna specifically highlight um, criterion 1.6 in category one, of course, which is the multi-hazard risk vulnerability assessment because this is really sort of the, uh, the apex opportunity to go deeper with resilient design and, and beyond the um, evaluation of resilience and hazards that we touch on in the PPS um, and deeper than the resilient design criteria in the 2015 um, criteria. So we know that the best way really for communities and projects to withstand these disasters and meet the risks that you're all sharing about is to really prepare. So in this criterion, we're asking teams to assess their properties and conduct an in-depth four-part hazard assessment. And based on these findings, identify strategies to implement to address these risks. And then in terms of our transaction and certification, we'll be looking to see the assessment that you use and then understand um, what strategies were incorporated into your project in response to the learnings that you gained from the assessment. Um, so this is a really exciting opportunity with just multifaceted benefits for your project that um, teams can engage in. Um, and again, this is an optional criteria, so a way to really help your project and provide benefits to residents and earn optional points as part of your certification threshold. Um, we have a wealth of resources to, to help um, support you uh, in resilience in our Enterprise Resource Center um, and encourage you to check them out. There are just so many and they're um, in sort of different disciplines of our initiatives work at Enterprise, but I wanna share out just a few um, to help guide you. Um, and as always, you know, if you have questions about these or 
other needs and we can help you uh, navigate other resources, don't hesitate to reach out. Um, in that vein, I'll just pause to see if there are comments on this topic or questions we can answer now. I think we may actually be a little bit ahead of time, which is <laughs> uh, a first for us. So let's see. Lauren, anything we should uh, tackle now in the chat box? Uh, no questions. So if you guys do have questions, please put them in. Yeah. Awesome. OK. Um, well, uh, again, really high level of how we're amplifying opportunities to really just go all in with resilience um, throughout the criteria. Uh, we reviewed that this general approach to resilience in the 2020 criteria and um, some big opportunities to enhance uh, the resilience in your projects. So um, I guess with that, uh, feel free to keep posing questions as you think of them. But um, Krista, I'll go ahead and shift back to you for health and housing. Great, thanks so much, Shelby. Um, so, so we're, we're getting to the more inclusive parts in some ways of, of our criteria. Resilience cuts across almost every single category of our criteria and every part of your development process and, and so does health in some ways. So what I'm going to share over the next few minutes is um, how health resident health, community health, is impacted by the decisions that you make in design, construction, and operations, and share with y'all um, a few of the mandatory health-promoting criteria that are new in 2020, and a few of the optional point opportunities that have to do with health also. I think that um, most of us have a story about ourselves or our family or our friends about how their home has actually affected their health and um, I'd like to see what stories you all have to share about that too. I would invite you to add anything about that to the chat. Um, I've got a couple of anecdotes. Years ago, I worked with um, someone who was really focused on energy efficiency. He lived and breathed energy efficiency and he lived in a single family home and um, it was an older home and he was hoping to make it more efficient and airtight. And so one of the things that he did was close his crawl space so that um, uh, for all the moisture and energy related benefits of that. Surprisingly, um, a few weeks later, months later, after sealing his crawl space, um, my colleague's wife realized that her allergies were gone. <laughs> her persistent allergies that she had had as long as they had ever lived in that home were, were suddenly gone. And so, um, they, they realized it was because that air sealing work um, was, was keeping the air from the crawl away from the condition space. And that had a dramatic effect on, on her health. Um, another health-related anecdote in relation to how homes affect our health is um, more personal for me. Um, my grandma lived on a farm in West Texas all of her life. My grandparents were, were farmers. And um, I remember going out to visit her in the summers when I was growing up. And even if you were inside of the house, you could smell when the crop dusters were coming by mm. because the house was so leaky. Um, you know, that air infiltration was bringing whatever it was picking up outside and bringing it inside and affecting our health. Um, and then the last, the third kind of anecdote that I'll just share is, is what we're all experiencing right now with COVID. Um, and I know that I've really appreciated that where I live is walkable, so I can go, I can walk and pick up groceries. <laughs> I can walk and go to the corner store and, you know, get some medicine. Um, and that walkability, that um, location and where my home is situated is, I've, I've been really grateful um, for during this time of COVID. So, you know, our homes affect our health in so many, so many different ways. Um, and the bottom line is that whether it's intentional or not, the decisions that we all make and design will impact the health of the people who live in your property. And we have this great opportunity to really make it a positive impact. 
Um, so let's, with all that, um, let's take a look at how the 2020 criteria affects health. So category seven is, um, is called healthy living environments. And this is where the majority of our health um, criteria show up. Um, although health measures do show up in, in every single category of our program. Um, in the 2020 version, we've broken the criterion up in this category into three different buckets that you can see named here on your screen. The first bucket really consists of tried and true strategies. And all of these strategies in this first bucket have been included in previous versions of green communities. They've each been tweaked a little bit, but these concepts will not be new to you. And all of these measures in the first bucket are mandatory. Um, what I would like to call out as a significant difference for a criterion in this section of category seven is seven six smoke-free policy. So um, from the beginning of green communities, we've had an optional criterion for developers who choose to implement a smoke-free policy in their buildings. Um, the difference with 2020 is that now implementing a smoke-free policy in all common areas and within a 25 foot radius of your building is required. And you can achieve optional points if you'd like to expand that to all residential sections of, of your property. The second section of this category, managing the indoor environment, um, it has more new categories um, than the others. And this is a combination of mandatory and optional criteria. Um, and I really just wanna call out um, the ventilation criterion, which hasn't changed dramatically from past versions of the criteria. I think that we're all really just seeing in this time of COVID where we're spending more time in our homes and when the quality of our air is even more important than ever, um, how important mechanical ventilation is, is shown, um, shown to affect our health. So I'd like to call that out. Then I mentioned the dehumidification criterion earlier with category five, that is brand new. Um, and for those of y'all in more humid locations, we'll be interested in pursuing that. Then we get to the third section of this category. Um, this includes three different measures. The first two, active design and beyond ADA, are, have been significantly modified from previous versions of our criteria. And then 713 healing center design is brand new, and it's based on emerging best practices and trauma-informed design. So with 2020, all projects are required to select one of these three to implement. You can choose which one it is, depending on which one is the best fit for your resident population. And I know that many of you all have struggled in the past with our active design uh, criterion. So if that isn't a good fit for you now, you don't have to do it. <laughs> you can do one of the other two. So I encourage you to check out um, those and see which is, a, which is a best fit for you. So while this category, category seven, addresses health directly, other strategies throughout the program also impact health. And in fact, one driving purpose of creating the 2020 criteria was amplifying the positive impacts that design can have on, on resident health. Um, and as part of that, we partnered with a number of different organizations in creating the criteria, but staff from the International Well Building Institute, IWBI, who run the well, certification program joined us in updating our green communities criteria um, and we worked with them closely to integrate their best practices and learnings and to try to translate their standards that are relevant for residential buildings into strategies that are guidelines for developers to implement that will result in the types of health outcomes that well staff promotes through its program and so by the end of our criteria development practice, we were um, pleased that we came to the agreement that um, the 2020 criteria includes measures that lead to the outcomes that well requires. And so all properties certifying to the 2020 criteria will automatically also receive well certification. There's nothing else you need to do. 
um, it's baked right in and the plaques that we'll be issuing for 2020 projects will be co-branded um, with both of our logos. So Green Communities is the first green building program to have this designation and we're really proud of it, um, especially now in the light of a global health pandemic. So I'm gonna stop sharing my slides and then um, we're gonna take a little bit of time to explore how other categories of the 2020 criteria um, do impact health. So in just a moment, we're gonna go back into some small breakout rooms and each of the breakout rooms will have an enterprise facilitator and they'll tell you which category you're gonna look at. <laughs> and when you get into the breakout room, you're just gonna go through as a group looking at the criteria site for the measures in your category to explore how you think those impact health and which ones you think might be most impactful and, and feasible for your projects. So Lauren just put those instructions in the chat. And as a reminder, you'll focus on one category that your enterprise facilitator will clue you in on when you get there. So I think with that, Gabby, um, you can break us up and then we'll come back and share out what we learned.
Great. Welcome back, everybody. Um, Lauren, do you have somebody from your group or would you like to share out about what you all found in categories one and eight about health? Um, we just briefly went through category one um, and category eight. And I think that um, what's really stuck out is the resident engagement piece um, that comes up in category one can really help you make decisions about what is the most important health aspects to focus on uh, later within the criteria. Um, and as you mentioned, Krista, in category seven, you know, having to pick between those three different criteria, um, active design, universal design, and um, or healing center design, that these charrettes um, and resident engagement can help inform which would be the most um, appropriate for your resident population. Great, great, thanks. Yep, and we've got the health action plan criterion and um, all sorts of things in category one and then a lot of health related measures and operations and maintenance at the back, so awesome. Um, Frederick, how about somebody from your group to share out about category two? Yeah, we had a really great conversation and I don't wanna to talk too much, so I'm going to see if someone from my group would love to share, Diane or LaShonda. You guys have some really great thoughts, so if one of you want to jump in. Sure. I'll, uh, I'll jump in. And um, ours had to do um, with the site and neighborhood selection. So we had a number that were really related to that kind of walkability component um, with compact development, but also access to transit. Um, access to fresh local foods, um, and then also, I lost my train of thought. Um, oh, I think we were talking about also, you know, when we're avoiding wetlands and floodplains and whatnot, that obviously has an impact um, by eliminating the possibility that, you know, there could be flooding and eventually mold and whatnot in, in your building. Thank you, Diane. Mm -hmm. Great. Shelby, over to you. I'll unmute you, Shelby. Whoops, sorry. I think I did that at the same time. Sorry, um, you know, we just started scratching the surface and I feel like we're, um, there was so much to talk about in category three, although maybe at first glance um, less so. Um, any folks from my group that would like to jump in and share? David or Caitlin or Kathleen? Uh, okay. I, I can share the, uh, the issue I was discussing on our side about the uh, soils in that we had a lot of old buildings that were on the site that had to be torn down and we had a lot of just old building materials that were dumped into the basement so we had to try to deal with the environmental issue of that and the soils bearing capability and then all all during that trying to control the runoff into the storm system and erosion control and all those kind of things. Yeah. Yeah, thanks for bringing up those site issues that are so important to you. Yeah, and another one we talked about uh, a specific challenge actually with noise pollution. So um, the site being located next to a railroad and um, another facility, I think it was, um, and how the project needed to mitigate the noise um, that could impact stress and other um, health conditions. So I think this sure illustrated for us that, um, as you said, health is, is everywhere. Great. Gabby, what about water? What did y'all discuss? Yeah, I thought we had a good discussion. Someone mentioned um, how like leaking in water was like an important thing um, in her for her and her projects. Um, and she, but she wasn't sure exactly if it related to health. And then someone else said that actually leaks do relate a lot to health because that could uh, a leak that goes unnoticed could cause mold and mildew, which causes health problems. And so I thought that was like a cool connection that we made about health and the water category. Thanks. Yeah, and Criterion 4.3 that Frederick talked about earlier with lead and Legionella um, is clearly all about health too. So, great, thanks. Um, Kirk, would you mind sharing out about our group, Group 5? Sure. 
So we were all about energy, which is probably one of the most obvious ones that has to do with health. But, um, you know, as we conserve and save energy, um, you know, there's less emissions from producing energy to make that. Um, but we, we got to talk about some, you know, more technical, um, you know, things that might not be thought about in the energy category with regards to health. Um, some about passive um, strategies as you start get to net zero. The only way to do that is to start incorporating passive strategies. So as you incorporate the passive strategies, you have um, the residents being more of a participant in the envelope where they're opening windows, you know, when they need to, you know, have extra uh, air movement through their building or, or whatnot to try and keep the energy usage down. But uh, there's also more usage of natural daylighting um, through those passive strategies, which in increases the health and wellness. Um, and then the final piece that we talked about was um, eliminating um, gas or combustion producing equipment within the, um, the footprint. So you're going all electric and, uh, you know, taking that piece away from residents and having the CO2 um, production in there. Did I miss anything? No, that was great. Yeah, cool. we covered a lot. Thank you for sharing out. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Um, so... So that wraps up our, our health category, recognizing that almost everything that you do in a property is, has the opportunity to affect the, the health of your community and that you can make proactive decisions, whether it's with site design and stormwater management or how you're handling leaks with your water in your building or materials that you're choosing. And um, I've just realized, Megan, that I was wrapping things up and I missed, <laughs> missed your category. So pardon me. Um, category six, materials, actually has so many things that have to do with health. Could you share a little bit about um, what you found in that section? Yeah, I don't know if Craig or Daniel want to talk a little bit about healthier material selection quickly. Okay. Um, well, we, we talked about uh, materials that off-gas. Uh, things that have your full metal hide in it. We got uh, high VOC products that are going to affect the affect the residents. Um, I guess there's a lot. We talked about mold, although mold may be more about putting the materials together correctly and good construction practices and good materials choices uh, to keep the water out. Um, and to to uh, to have proper proper ventilation and and mechanical systems, but uh, certainly materials can can affect that. Yep. Awesome. Um, there's there's lots of other lots of other stuff about uh, sourcing, you know, uh, regional products. We can talk. We could talk about. Um, there's there's um, life cycle. Uh, costs on products. Um, yeah, I'll stop. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks. That was that was helpful. Megan, do you want to lift up anything else, or is that a good summary? No, I think we spent a lot of time talking about the, you know, um, how we could think about healthier healthier materials, and there's a lot I think within that. Um, all of the different sections of materials really have an impact on people's health because um, what you build your housing with in the place that you spend the most time has a large impact on your health. And so um, we just talked a little bit about, about that. Great. Yeah, and with the 2020 criteria, um, you'll notice if you've been familiar with previous versions that in this category, materials, We've added three new measures that start off this category that are about transparency and then optimization about what makes up the materials that you're building your project of and how do those impact health. Um, this has been a longstanding question um, that the sector has had. Um, many product manufacturers have understandably wanted to keep those um, ingredients close to their chest. Um, but um, so it's been more difficult to understand how they impact health. But um, Google has actually invested a large sum of money in this transparency project. And 
many other organizations who are behind um, health product declarations and the Healthy Building Network, for instance, and ILFI have been doing some fantastic work to, to shed some light in this area. So thanks for that. So with that, that truly does wrap up the health section. <laughs> so we talked about category seven in the beginning and then got a glimpse at how all of the other seven categories impact health as well. So thank you all for, for diving into that. Um, so with that, we are up for another break. We're going to take a 10 minute break again. And then when we come back after the break, uh, we'll turn it over to Shelby, um, who will dive more into the certification process. So see you all in about 10 minutes.
All right, looks like folks are uh, settling back in. Um, as Krista shared, um, over the next 20 minutes or so, we're gonna switch gears from talking about the criteria content to uh, how to certify. Um, now that we've really engaged in different ways with the criteria, we'll, uh, sort of do a refresher on the certification timeline, the tools available to support project teams through certification, and how to access these tools and when to use them. Uh, I know that many of you on the call are familiar with our processes, uh, but I'd like to go ahead and share a fun video that we developed last year uh, that walks through sort of the big picture of how to certify. Um, for anyone who wants to watch it over and over again, it's available on our website and I'll just pull it up now. Uh, so here goes, oops. When you're developing green, affordable housing, you're balancing a lot. And the Enterprise Green Communities Certification Portal has been designed to help. You'll work through two phases, pre-build and post-build. Apply for pre-build at least 30 days before construction and post-build within 60 days of completion. First, create an account. Once logged in, you'll see three tabs, green certification details, green portfolio overview, and certification map. To start an application, go to green certification details and click on new certification. Assign your project a name and select a template. Not in New York City? Choose the national template. Select your construction type, new construction, moderate rehab, or substantial rehab, where the work area exceeds 50% of the aggregate area of the building. Next, select your project setting. Not sure of suitability? Visit the USDA's Rural Eligibility website and type in the address. The correct template and construction type are critical. They determine the application fields for your submission and can't be changed in the future. Now you'll be able to input project information and capture your criteria compliance. This is your hub for tracking everything related to your certification but it's also a tool to assist you in the process. 
you can view compliance, exemptions, rationale, recommendations, and resources for each criterion. And as the project progresses, you can enter new information and upload documentation. You'll be able to track certification points and choose which goals make sense for your project. Once you've submitted your application, it enters a 30-day review period. Afterwards, you'll either receive an approval by email or a request for more information. To revise your application, return to Criteria Compliance. Message bubbles that are highlighted in red indicate areas where our team needs clarification. Open the collaboration by clicking on the message bubble. You can also communicate about this project through this tool. After construction, return to the portal for post build. Update your application to reflect any changes that may have happened during construction. Double check that the criteria you intended to pursue were satisfied. Evaluate each criterion item, and if there haven't been changes since pre-build, simply write no deviations in the Describe Deviations text box. If changes have occurred, note them here. Submit, and once your post-build application is approved, you will receive an email confirmation. If you've indicated that you want a plaque, it will be sent your way. Ready to get started? Create an account today. All right. So I hope that whet everyone's appetite for uh, the certification process here. I'm just gonna pull my slides up again. <clears throat> Great. So we've talked through, again, how the criteria has been updated. Uh, generally, the steps of certification that uh, many of you are familiar with are largely the same. Pre-build applications uh, are due 30 days prior to construction, and post-build applications are due within 60 days of construction completion. And within these phases, we'll work together on your certification the same manner that, that we did before. Um, we'll process re-review, or excuse me, reviews and re-reviews within 30 days of submission. And we'll provide comprehensive feedback if we need more information on any strategies or documentation uh, for approval of either phase. Uh, our waiver process remains the same. Uh, for those who are not as familiar, um, as part of the certification process, we've included a formal um, way for teams to uh, make requests uh, for waivers for mandatory criterion when extenuating circumstances preclude compliance. So um, just as before, we'll look out for your requests in the online portal and um, work together uh, and communicate closely to chart the best course forward, if um, the case may be. And um, we'll be here for technical assistance throughout. So um, any questions that come up about your certification process, um, uh, any questions about working in the portal or content questions, we're here to support you through this transition. So don't hesitate to lean on us really. Um, and a little bit later, Frederick will give uh, info on how to reach out to us. Um, but in any case, with all of the new content, uh, we do have a few changes to sort of help you through the process. Um, and Krista um, was able to walk through some of these features earlier on today. I'll just use them as references. Um, but we're really focused on the 2020 website now for planning and collaborating with your team. I'm gonna do a quick new share to reorient us. Um, to the 2020 site that we've been many times today. 
Um, so this is uh, the preparation, the place to go when you're preparing to certify, right? So um, as Krista shared, all of the information and resources that you'll need for the 2020 criteria may be found here. Just key highlights again, um, the full criteria is available in a user-friendly format, uh, toggling between criteria and filtering for construction type uh, to show you only those requirements and available criterion for your project type. Uh, so that's a new feature that we didn't have before um, and think it's been really helpful for just navigating the content on our own. Um, the checklists that are available here uh, in numerous versions, so um, a hard copy download, an Excel that you can uh, modify after you download it. You can engage with this checklist version online to tally points um, and you could also uh, download a full PDF of the criteria. Um, so great ways to access the information and manipulate it so that it's useful for you and your team. Um, and this is only for the 2020 criteria. Um, again, all updates to the criteria will be posted on the 2020 Addenda and FAQ page. Um, you'll see some changes have already been made uh, that may impact some Ohio teams. And finally, um, all of the templates that we've talked about today, just wanna reorient you to this page. Um, this is a one-stop shop to gather all of the documents uh, for your certification submission. And actually um, also is uh, the documentation instructions. It really outlines everything that you'll need for each criterion um, to submit, which brings me to, um, uh, the next piece that I want to just remind everyone about is uh, ensuring that we all remember that while we have this fancy new website, um, we're still working with the portal to build the application and submit them. Um, we can now create a new project using the 2020 template just for fun. Hooray, it's here. and to navigate through all of your projects um, as you did before. So um, although there are a lot of ways that you can review all of your objectives and the, using the website, um, encourage you to just keep in mind that you'll be completing the uh, application in the portal. The portal lives on as it did in 2015. Um, and one uh, new change, given all of these new features um, and enhancements in our program, actually, for the first time when completing your project, uh, you uh, for the 2020 criteria only, uh, projects will incur a fee that is collected in the portal, both at pre-build and post-build. Uh, so look out for that. Happy to answer any questions that you have um, along the way. And finally, uh, just want to orient everyone back to the Enterprise Green Communities website, which is another resource um, where we're sharing updates um, to current events that may impact uh, certification and other parts of our Green Communities program, and also um, access to uh, recordings and uh, of these trainings and other events and really um, all resources related to green communities. So I'll go back to my slide deck for a moment here. <clears throat> um, and I should have said this before, but any questions on the process that maybe I plowed through at a high level, feel free to uh, pose questions in the chat. Since we have a couple minutes now while folks may be doing that, I'm actually gonna toss out a pop quiz uh, in the format of the poll. So um, I'll go ahead and read the question aloud and maybe I'll just paste it in the chat so you have it and then 
Gabby, if you could um, enable the poll, that would be great. So the first question is just um, about 2020 resources. So how to navigate the tools and resources that you'll need. The scenario is this. Um, I'll paste it here. Your project team has been engaged in a holistic integrative design process for a new construction senior living facility with residents and community stakeholders uh, for the past three months. You've gathered input and you've weighed design options and you're ready to tally the optional criteria identified as priorities for your project to certify to green communities. You'd like to do this in a format that can be easily shared with and modified by all team members. So the pop quiz question is, what certification tool would support these needs and where could you go to utilize it? Gabby, I'll defer to you to shut it down when you think everyone's responded who is able. Yeah, sure. Awesome, all right. So there are a lot of ways to view this. So in some way, nobody's wrong. Um, but the great thing about the Excel checklist download, um, which is available on the 2020 website along with all of the resources is that you can manipulate it once you've downloaded it uh, and share it across project teams. But um, really accessing the other documents would be a great way to collaborate as well. So one more question about the certification timeline. Uh, so your contractor confirmed that your supportive housing project will break ground in 45 days. You've engaged in a collaborative and inclusive integrative design process months ago and your CDs are complete. As you're intending to certify to green communities, what must your project team complete in the next two weeks to ensure you're meeting the certification timeline? Nice. All right, so the answer here is really both of the above. Um, Pre-build applications are due 30 days in advance, so um, this team would want to be ready to submit in a couple of weeks uh, to meet that timeline. And then the project priority survey is a part of the integrative design process that should happen uh, with the pre-build or should be submitted with the pre-build application. So if it's not already complete, hopefully the team is working on it during this time. Um, great, well, thanks for playing along with me here. Just uh, hope to get everyone thinking about real-time application given the infrastructure and content that we've gone over today. Um, we know it's been a lot of information. Um, I'll go ahead and pause here. Uh, Lauren, if there are any chat questions that popped up that we should address now. Uh, just one question came up and I think it'd be good to repeat for the group. Um, do we require individuals who are submitting documentation in the portal like for a project to have any certifications or accreditations or anything like that in order to do that? Good question. Um, so, for 
green communities, there's no sort of green community certified technician like there are for some other green building programs. Um, we work with architects and developers and green building consultants, um, all members of the project team to process your application. Um, but uh, depending on how you're meeting our building performance uh, standard in category five, the um, one thing I'll point out is just that you would need to have a certified HERS rater as part of your project team. But again, that's a, a different thing um, for working with us. There's no exam or certification. Happy to work with all of you. And we just had another question come in um, about fees associated with um, Green Communities 2020 criteria. Great. Um, hovering, but I'm not getting the chat. Could you read it out? Would that be okay? Yeah, it's just what are the fees associated with our oh, what criteria? Are they? Sorry, yeah. at pre yeah, what are they? there's one fee. It's $1,250 that's processed uh, when a full application is submitted for the first time uh, in the portal. And at post-build, there's a $300 fee when the application is submitted. I've got another one. Should I keep going? Yeah, um, sure. We just have a couple minutes. So why don't we grab this next one? I, I've actually pulled it up here from Cynthia. Um, yes. If there are multiple projects or multiple buildings in a project with different scopes, is there a way to choose multiple construction types or would we do multiple applications? Um, so every project has its own nuances that we could talk through. Um, with you specifically, but uh, generally uh, projects with different scopes would sort of follow and meet a different criteria profile and would need to be submitted separately. Um, the biggest one is probably that category five mandatory building performance standard um, as it differs widely for new construction and rehab. But um, again, really happy to talk about uh, specific project questions if you have them uh, at another time. <clears throat> um, all right, well, I might just go ahead and recap and hand it over to Frederick. Um, thanks for engaging in this last section here. Um, hopefully you're leaving with a refresher of the general timeline and, and big processes associated with certification and um, also where to go to find the resources um, to be successful. Um, I'll hand the deck back to Frederick or actually I'll keep the deck up Frederick but I'll hand it to you for Q&A and wrap up. Thanks Shelby. Um, I'm just gonna let you get to the last slide. There we go. Great. So yes, please keep, I see some of you have been submitting your questions. Please keep them coming. Um, we love, we have set aside at least 10 minutes for, to answer them. So this is the time to, to ask. So while you're doing that, um, I do want to let you all know that we do have a technical assistance provider database. And I just want to shout out everyone who is part of our database already. Um, I'm sure there are a few of you on the line. Um, and this database has um, a list of lists top experts throughout the entire country and topics related to green building, public health, and community engagement principles um, specific to the affordable housing sector. These professionals are equipped to help you in complying with various aspects of the criteria. Um, and if you would like to become a TA provider or need to search for someone that serves your area, you may follow the link that was just shared um, in the chat. And if you have any specific questions when it comes to the criteria, criteria please reach out to our certification inbox um, at certification at enterprisecommunity.org. It is up on the screen and we can share that in the chat as well. Um, 
So you can copy paste that. Oops. Sorry, and we did it twice. Sorry about that. And yeah, if you have any questions, please submit them now. Or Lauren, if there were any that should be called out now that we didn't fully say out loud during the today's conversation, that'd be perfect to bring up now. So while we wait for questions to come in, please type them in. Um, we have a couple of questions that typically come up, which is, and I'm going to go through those right now so everyone um, is aware. What is the date that you can't use the 2015 criteria after? Yeah. Oh, do you want me to answer? Should we? Sorry. Yes, yes, yeah. How about <laughs> I answer it? I would yes. just like pop quiz for everyone, yes. Um, anyway, uh, October 15th, 2020 is the absolute last possible date that you can use 2015. After that, it will be all 2020. And do you have to have your pre-build approval by that date? You do not, but you do have to have a full application submitted. We will not accept shell applications. Can you um, certify through the new Green Communities website? No, you cannot. You can use that as part as a tool to um, go through your pre-build and post-build process and work with your team but you will still need to go through the certification portal, which is the same as we've been doing for 2015. So that should be continued to be used. Great. And how many points do you need to certify with the 2020 criteria? And is that the same or different than the 2015 criteria? Good question. So 2015 for uh, rehab projects, you needed to have at least 30 points. And for new construction projects, you needed to have at least 35. For 2020, you will need to have um, at least 35 points for rehab projects and 40 points for new construction. Great. Thank you for sharing that. You're welcome. And just repeat that date again so that everyone so, has it. The date, the <laughs> date that you can't use the 2015 anymore. Yeah. October 15th, 2020 is the last day you can submit a 2015 criteria application that is fully filled out and ready for submission. Great. And then one last question, and we'll mm -hmm. see if we get any more in the chat box, is um, has the certification timeline changed from the 2015 to 2020 criteria? It has not. So it is still 30 days prior to um, construction to submit your pre-build application and 60 days within construction end date to submit your post-build. Great. Thank you. Mm -hmm. We did have one question come in um, from Michael. So it's been a while since I was immersed in energy and auditing in energy auditing. So this question, we'll see if we can get to what you're asking, Michael. What level of energy auditing versus ASHRAE standards should be used when modeling your rehab slash new construction? Krista, do you wanna take that one? Yeah, I'd be happy to. So um, Michael, it sounds like you're remembering um, that when you do an energy audit, when you're, looking to assess like how much energy in a, an existing building is using. Um, ASHRAE has three levels of audits. Like level one is just like a walkthrough. Level two is energy survey and, and more analysis. And energy three is, is really detailed. Um, we're actually not looking for any of those three levels <laughs> um, with, with green communities because we're not looking at um, improving the performance of energy efficiency of the building by a certain amount. Instead, we're looking at projecting um, how the building will compare to a certain level of the ASHRAE code once the rehab is finished. So in category five, um, you can see that we have a certain, uh, certain version of ASHRAE that we refer to depending on if you're new construction or a rehab. 
Um, so you would be modeling the building against as if it were built to that version of ASHRAE and then comparing the two. Great. Great, that was the, that was the last question. Awesome. Well, thanks everybody. I'm gonna pass it over to Krista to wrap us up. Great, thanks Frederick. Yeah. And um, I'll, I'll recap what we've talked about in just a second, but I'll ask Gabby to go ahead and put um, a link to an evaluation form in the chat box. And it just has a few questions and it would be really useful to us if you all could, could fill it out and we can use some time um, here before four o'clock for you all to do that um, as well. But we've come to the close of our time together this afternoon. So we've talked about the 2020 criteria as a tool. We've talked about it as a collection of strategies that you can use to meet and amplify your project objectives. At the beginning of the workshop, we discussed integrative design and how to lift up resident pri priorities. We've experimented with evaluating site plans through the lens of an ERPS. We've looked at calculating indoor water consumption compared to a baseline. We've talked about the path to zero with energy consumption. We've reviewed opportunities to enhance project resilience, built an understanding of health promoting strategies in the 2020 criteria and review the certification process and available tools. So as a whole, these strategies can ensure that the homes that you all are developing are built to last. Um, they're going to provide healthy living environments and homes, will be efficient, will have a light touch on the land, and will be affordable for the long run. So um, that brings us to an end of what we had prepared to share with you all today. We really appreciate your time, and we really look forward to working with you all um, throughout your next projects. So please do take a few minutes to fill out the short evaluation um, and then get in touch with us at the certification email box with with anything else you may have so thanks so much everybody um and um and that'll do it for today so really appreciate your time and have a great rest of your afternoon thank you everybody have a good day